Hello and welcome everyone to Day 33's podcast. In this podcast, we're going to talk about specific parts from chapters 29 and 30. You, you certainly don't need to know both of these chapters entirely. In this podcast, we're going to focus on objective one. This is the heaviest objective of the chapter and of the day. And in this objective, we'll talk about how land plants evolved from green algae and some of the adaptations they needed to acquire. So let's begin by drawing our standard phylogenetic tree where we have the bacteria, this abbreviated BAC, our archaea, and then we form the eukaryotes. We have protists, plants, fungi, and then animals. Animals we'll talk about on the, in the next class. And we're going to focus on plants. And remember, protist plants, fungi, and animals are all eukaryotes, meaning they all have organelles. Plants, fungi, and animals represent single kingdoms, and protists represent multiple kingdoms. And we know that there are some protists that resemble plants, some protists that more resemble fungi. And so its placement is probably not 100% accurate. Because what we're going to tell you here, and what we talked about before, is that the green algae gave rise to the plants. Some of the evidence that supports this is that green algae and plants share some key features. And let's write them here. They're multicellular. They're eukaryotic, so these are kind of general ones that we are going to find true as we move forward here. Both the green algae and plants undergo photosynthesis. We haven't talked about this yet, but we will. And thus they each have chloroplasts because of that. And they have cell walls. Similar cell walls, I should say. So and let me say, explain that a little bit more. They both contain cellulose. This in itself isn't unique because uh, there were other protists that also had cellulose. But it's the way it's formed. So I'm going to just write for, formed. And in your notes, you might want to just say the cell walls, the cellulosic cell walls of green algae and plants form the cellulose in a very unique way. You don't have to worry about what that is. Your book goes into it, but just know that they, they do this. The land plants that do have a flagellated sperm is similar to the flagellated, flagellated sperm of green algae. I'm going to write flagellated sperm. Have, they have a similar structure, so they're similar. We see flagellated sperm in other protists, but this is a very unique structure of these two. And here I'm just going to write similar cell division. Clearly cell division is seen before, but there are some unique aspects of cell division that they share with the protists. But for right now, just know that they have similar cell divisions. Okay, as I was getting ready to erase it, I realized that this branch and this branch were not properly labeled where they were labeled, but you couldn't see it because it was off the screen. But this was supposed to be fungi, and this is supposed to be animals. You probably knew that from previous discussions, but just so that it was complete. How do we believe plants evolved from green algae? Let's draw a little water barrier here. This is our water on this side, and this is our land on this side. We would have various green algae here. In fact, this is true today that we have green algae in the water and then as the water dries up as it might do on occasion let's go and get rid of our line here so maybe it dries up to back here most of these green algae will die but these two for instance survive and they survive because they have certain adaptations that allow them to survive for short periods of time until the water comes back they wouldn't be able to survive for long, long periods of time, but they can survive for short periods of time. 
Now for these green algae to have made this complete transition into land to become plants, they would have had to have accumulated several adaptations. To survive permanently on land. Why would they have done this? Why not just stay in the water? Well, they may not have had a choice for one, but once they made it to the land, there might have been some advantages to staying on the land. So some benefits include more sun and CO2. You could get this in the water, but it's being blocked by the, the water itself and various other organisms that happen to be in the, in the water with them. The soil had rich nutrients in it. Some problems include less water, obviously. Initially, no structural Support. They just spent millions of years in the water as a species, a species. And when you plop them on land, the gravity uh, that's associated with the land um, would cause them to collapse. Your, your book gives a nice example when they say, if you've ever seen a jellyfish that's taken out of the water, it just sort of collapses on itself. And this is exactly what would have happened as, as algae moved to land. In addition, your book doesn't specifically mention this one, but it's a pretty important one. They have less ability to move. In the water, it was easier to move around just because of being in the water and being in the fluid environment. But on land, this was not as, as possible. So to overcome some of these problems so that they could enjoy these benefits, they had to adapt key features. So let's erase this and talk about these key features. The first one we want to talk about is this thing called alterations of generations. And they alternate between two structures called, called the gametophyte and the sporophytes. I'm going to just give the definitions of these really short definitions of these, and then I'm going to explain their role by drawing a, a figure for you. So gametophyte. And then a sporophyte. Gametophytes are haploid gamete producing plants. Plant stage, I should say. Let me go ahead and erase sporophyte here. So we have a little bit more room. I should also tell you that the gametophyte is a multi cell cellular structure. The sporophyte is when two gametes come back together and you form this zygote and it undergoes mitosis to make the sporophyte. It is also multicellular. It will later on go on to generate spores. So this is the spore producing plant. It's important to remember that plants go through this alternation of generations where at one part of their life they're gametophyte and in another part of their life they're sporophyte. Some plants will spend the majority of their life as a gametophyte, and other plants, the dominant part of their life would be the sporophyte. 
I'm going to explain this in a different way by showing you a figure. So let me erase this. We'll start with the gametophyte up here. Remember, it's haploid, so it's one in. Then through mitosis, it produces haploid gametes. So these are also one in. But remember, a key feature here is it's generating these gametes by mitosis because you're going from one in to one in, haploid to haploid. These haploids then can fertilize each other, sometimes from another plant, and then some species, it's the same, it could be the same plant. So we're, we'll write fertilization. And we're going to form the zygote. We're going to begin the next stage of, our, of the plant's life, so I'm going to use a different color, zygote. And the zygote now is 2N, it's diploid. Then through mitosis, it generates the sporophyte. And because it's using mitosis, it goes from diploid to diploid. So these will also be diploid. The sporophytes will then undergo meiosis to produce spores. And I'm going to go back to blue because these spores, through mitosis, will generate the gametophyte generation once again. I should mention since we're using meiosis, going from 2N, the products now will be 1N spores. They go through meiosis, my, mitosis, I'm sorry, to generate the same haploid gametophyte, but it's a multicellular structure. So looking at this figure, we're going to point out some of the other key adaptations. And it's right here is the second adaptation. And it's that the embryos develop in the protection of parental tissue. This is a really important. This is a, by doing this, the embryo is pr protected from the harsh conditions of the environment and also the parental tissue can provide nutrients. Another really important feature are these spores. These spores contain a very thick wall, which protects them from dehydration, protects them from dehydration, and it allows them to be moved, to spread, it allows The spread of spores. The last feature I'm going to show you here, I should put this as our third, for the wild spore, is with the gametophyte. And the adaptation here that is key is that it's multicellular. The gametophyte is multicellular. And this protects gametes as they're being made. Okay, this last adaptation is called the apical meristem. One of the key problems the plants faced was that the light and CO2 it needed for photosynthesis was above ground, but the nutrients we're below ground. This line indicates the ground. So the plant would grow upwards where the light and CO2 was. So we call these 
shoots. The shoots would move up. And the roots would move down to get to the nutrients. But remember, the plant can't move. So if it doesn't find any nutrients here, or if there's a sh shade here, the plant has to be able to grow in order to get to this increased sunlight or to get to the nutrients down here. The way it does this is by using a very special tissue called apical meristem. And this is found at the tips. So we have some apical meristem tissue here, and then we also have it at the, at the roots. These tissues called apical meristem, they are very similar to stem cells in the fact that they can specialize and grow cells that allow specialized tissues to form, but also allows the cells to move in the directions as it's growing into the proper directions where it's going to find light, CO2, or nutrients. Remember, the algae, as they lived in water, they had an equal, roughly equal distribution of the nutrients and the CO2 of light, depending upon the specific region. Some other adaptations that the plants over time developed, and this, this is not shown in the figure, but they're list, it's listed in the text itself, is cuticle. If you were to draw a plant or a leaf, let's draw kind of a leaf here, it will form a waxy polymer on the outside of it. So the cuticle is a waxy polymer found on the part of the plant above the ground and it prevents drying out, prevents dehydration, I'm going to say. So this was a key challenge. Not being in this water environment, the plant had to develop some way to maintain water within the plant. Seventh here is the stomata. It's one of my favorite science words. Stomatas if we look up here at our plant, they are tiny pores. I'm not drawing them too tiny here because I want you to see them. But they're very small pores found in the plant, particularly in plants with leaves, the leaves. These stomata allow for the movement of CO2 into the plant and then oxygen out of the plant. They will also help prevent um, dehydration as well. So let's listen down here, CO2 and O2 movement and prevents dehydration as well. Because in addition to CO2 moving in and oxygen moving out, Water can also move in and out through these stomata. So in very dry environments, these stomata will constrict and allow for a less movement of water out of, the, out of the plant. All right, let's erase this. And let's think about how scientists categorize plants. The first way that we do this is by dividing them up into vascular and non-vascular. Plants with a vascular tissue have cells that form tubes and then these tubes move water and nutrients throughout the cell. throughout the plant, I should say. And so plants that have this vascular tissue are called vascular plants. Plants that don't are called non-vascular.
roughly 93% of all plant species are vascular. Now we can break down all plants using vascular or non-vascular into four groups. The next podcast are going to focus on each of these groups, but let's mention them real quick. We have the bryophytes. And these are like our mosses that you may see outside. The key feature of the bryophytes is that they are non-vascular. They are the only group that is non-vascular. Our second group would be our pyrophytes. Examples of these would be like our ferns. They are also our first vas vascular plant. But they are seedless. Our third group represents our gymnosperm. These are also vascular plants and they have seeds. That's what distinguishes them. Our fourth group, the angiosperm, these also have seeds and they also are vas vascular plants, but their key feature is that they are flowering plants. All right, that ends this first podcast over objective one. There will be one more podcast that cover the last four objectives, but there's not a lot of detail in those last four objectives. If you have any questions, please uh, let us know. Bye.